Grindset, inside the mind of successful entrepreneurs with your host, Cynthia Daniels and William Sprague. Welcome back to another episode of Grindset. I'm your host, Cynthia Daniels, Chief Event Strategist of Cynthia Daniels and Company. And I'm your co-host, William Sprack, your favorite banker. And today's guest is Dr. Christina Rosenthal. She is the owner and CEO of Paradigm Dental Center. She's also the founder of the 516 Foundation Incorporated. And she has an initiative determined to be a doctor someday that is designed to help students ages 14 through 18 find mentors and to become doctors in the Memphis community. Isn't that incredible? I mean, that's amazing. You know, not only is she Dr. Rosenthal, a dentist, she's also a Delta and she's doing good in the community. So I'm really looking forward to this interview um, with Dr. Rosenthal. Absolutely. I know her personally and her story is just such an unconventional one. And to know where she is today, she's very determined herself. So it's going to be a great interview, Brad. Yeah, Cynthia, I'm definitely looking forward to it. And so Grindset audience, we'll be right back after the break with Dr. Christina T. Rosenthal. Grindset. I'm Leslie Lynn Smith, President and CEO of Epicenter, and we've partnered with Kazookian. Each episode, hosts Cynthia Daniels and Williams Brack talk shop with Memphis' brightest and best entrepreneurs. Check it out by downloading the Kazookian app or find us on your favorite podcast provider. What well, you had the Buffalo, you had the Buffalo but, game, but, but understand New York and upstate New York, they are not moderates by any measure. They may Am not, I right? They may not be, but guess what? Even conservatives get sick. Funky politics on the Kazookian Network. Mindset. We're back in the studio, and today's guest is Dr. Christina Rosenthal. Welcome to Grindset. Yes, the pleasure is mine. We're glad to have you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And you wear so many hats. So we're going to try to juggle as many as we can and get these questions in. So we're just going to jump right into this interview. Um, So Dr. Rosenthal, tell us about Paradigm Dental Center and how did it get started? Paradigm Dental Center is a revolutionary dental center that seeks to provide quality care to the entire family. We opened in 2006 and the cornerstone of our operation has always been service to the community beyond our four walls. Okay. And what motivated you to start the, your dental center? I was working at a dental corporation one year after dental school and I realized, you know, I'm making all of this money for this company and I could be making it for myself. And so I was at the office about nine months in, decided I'm going to seek funding. I called one bank. They approved me for $250,000. And I'm like, if it comes this easily, let me call another bank. So I called another bank, and they approved me for $350,000. I was like, doors are open. Okay. So from that point on, it was a lot of planning and execution, and we opened approximately five months later. Now, was the... I mean, that's incredible. Now, was the bank money all you brought to start, or did you bring some of your own money into it as well? It was all somebody else's money. Oh, OP, OPM. Yes. <laughs> I, I had just graduated. I from love it. School, you know, so I was only at this other dental practice for a few months before I made this decision. And when I made this decision, I was pregnant with my second son. So I will be opening this new office wow. pregnant or with a newborn, which, you know, whenever it decided to open up. So. That's truly an entrepreneur spirit. You said one year after you figured out, I need to do this on my own. That's pretty credible. Pretty incredible. So, I mean, let, let's let's not skip into that, right? So you're pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, you're a year after dental school. You're working for this dental corporation and you decided you wanted to go into business for yourself, but mm-hmm. you're still pregnant. N- no money. Now, fortunately, dental school and being a doctor affords you special financing perks. Um, from banks and other institutions, but you're still pregnant. And so let, let, let's just go into, I'm sorry, Cynthia, let's just go into the timeline of, you know, leaving the corporation to opening your doors day one. Okay. So I've always been willing to bet on myself and I realized that I'll never know everything about everything. Okay. But in, in dental school, I had a business plan prepared. Now, I didn't know if the way I planned it or envisioned it would come to fruition just as I planned it, 
but mm-hmm. I had the document. And so it was almost like a written contract with myself. Now, my goal was to go to dental school, practice for 10 years, stack my money and pay <laughs> cash for a practice. Right. So I would go into it with no debt. So that was still the plan. That was still the plan, but it was ten. It was a ten year plan. It wasn't right. uh, not merely a year plan. <laughs> I'm at this practice, and I'm seeing things that ideologically don't align with my practice philosophy. To put it in the most yeah. uh, conservative terms that I can put <laughs> in. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I went home and I talked to my husband. I was like, "Look, I have got to move." And he he asked me, "Do you think you're ready to do it yourself?" I would never say no, even if I was scared. <laughs> and my boots, I confidently was like, yeah. Yeah. So the next day he was like, well, call it, call around and see what the prerequisites are or the requirements are to get funding. So my calls were really just to get information. Wow. Was, and, and what I learned is because healthcare, especially dentistry, is a safe bet. Well, many funders view, and you may think all, differently, but at this time they viewed dentistry as a safe bet. And they were willing to take a chance. And I didn't think I would get approved because I had student loans. I had minor credit card debt, but I didn't bring anything to the table. And I was just in awe that I got approved so quickly. And then again, a second time by another institution. So to, to continue to lay out that process, so I got approved for funding. Now, at this time, I'm still working for this company, so I got to do this very strategically. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, I, I think the whole grind set audience is really about to appreciate what you're, you're about to say now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, juggling. Like, I'm in a one-year contract with this employer, so I have to really carefully play this out. And so my contract was to be up in July. Here it is, maybe February. And now I'm meeting with contractors. So in my spare time when I get out of work, I'm seeking out space. And my goal was to find a place that was already a, a pre-existing dental office. That way I wouldn't have to pay for plumbing. It would reduce my initial cost, right? That's very smart, so I, yeah. I, had to find, I ended up finding one that was five minutes away from my house, which was very convenient, especially being pregnant. If I needed to go up to the office for any reason, it's only five minutes away from the kid. Well, I shouldn't say the kid, my child. <laughs> <laughs> we know what you meant. <laughs> and, then, and then return, you know, and then coming back. So relatively soon. So the contractor kind of helped me and walked me through everything because, again, all I knew was dentistry. I didn't know the operational aspects of a dental office, like buying a compressor, buying a vacuum, buying sterilization equipment and operatory equipment. I didn't know any of that. And from what he told me, I would do my own independent research. So here we are. Now we're like in in what May and I'm getting a little panicky because I know my contract is up with this employer. I could have left, but I decided to fulfill my commitment. Okay. Because, you know, you always want to leave on good terms. And I right. senior doctor a vacation, but it worked out so well for me because when July was over, I had to have a maternity leave. My son was due the next month in August. Wow. We didn't open until October. So I had him in August and two months later we were operating. Wow. <laughs> that is quite a story. Thank Brack. Thank you for backing us up into that because we were about to lose all of that. Um, I mean, I mean, it's an incredible, it's an incredible story, and it shows yeah. the dedication and commitment and the work ethic that it takes to pull that off. Absolutely. And so, Dr. Rosenthal was telling us how you were able to juggle and and make it work for you. Is there anything you would have done differently? Like, let's say there's a, a fellow dentist uh, listening now, wanting to open their own practice. Would you recommend anything differently, or would you just say go in there and make it work? Go in and lowball your costs. I was trying to get state of the art everything. And what I realized, a lot of my patients don't care about state of the art. art. (laughs) They just want good quality care and an affordable cost and good customer service. Like that's what they want. So uh, what what services does your practice actually offer? We're general dental practice, meaning we do everything. Now, I don't do braces or some complicated wisdom tooth extractions or root canals, but pretty much we do everything. And so thank you for going into the background. I mean, we're off to a great start. And so we're going to bring the Grindset audience back to the present to hear about what's happening, especially during this COVID-19 and coronavirus time. And so that's what we're going to talk about when we get back. Grindset. Riffin on jazz. When two friends get together to kick it about jazz, it's called Riffin on Jazz. Catch us Riffin on Jazz 
every week right here on your favorite broadcast or podcast platforms. Riffin' on jazz on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian! Grind Set. Welcome back to Grind Set. We're here with Dr. Christina T. Rosenthal, owner and founder of Paradigm Dental Center. Now, during COVID-19, the dental industry was hit very, very, very hard. How did that impact your practice and where are you today? So it impacted my practice heavily. We had to close for two months. And the confusing part was we were considered an essential service, right? Right. But although we were considered a, an essential service, we were limited in the scope of practice. So they limited us to emergency and urgent care only. So you had patient demand. You had patients calling and saying, well, to me, my cleaning is an emergency. Or to me, you know, right. the filling done is an emergency. But we're right. like, no, according to, you know, the Center for Disease Control or according right. to, you know, this standard or protocol, we are unable to see. It. So it was a lot of confusion. Not to mention, we also had conflicting information being given by several governmental agencies. Every day. <laughs> every, and it changed every single day. Yeah. So there was just so much uncertainty. And most of us took the safe route in just closing and just addressing emergency concerns as, as they arose. And if there was maybe an extraction that was needed, we would um, refer them to an oral surgeon for care. So okay. that's how a lot of us handled it. So don't think your dentist was neglecting you. We were simply confused by all the information and misinformation that was being distributed to us. And there was a lack of guidance and leadership. So. So that, that's on an operational basis, but the government recommended you kind of close practice or operate on a limited basis. But financially, how did you get through it? And then did you use any of the government related funds during that period? Oh, personally, I was hit hard, <laughs> you know, because you're used when you see patients, that's an, an ongoing stream of income. Right. Right. But when that stops, of course, if you have uh, accounts receivables, maybe from. And accounts receivables merely means money that's owed to you um, from insurance companies. I use it as a time to re-strategize. Okay, I'm not seeing patients. How can I bring revenue into this practice? So what I did was create my accounts receivables report and really tackle those insurance companies who had outstanding payments that need to be paid. At this time, because I do lead my practice with the heart, both head and heart, I didn't want to go into the pockets of my patients that much so much if they had balances because I knew all of us were having a tough time. Right. However, the insurance companies, I need my coins, right? <laughs> right. So that was one, that was one um, revenue source. And then as I would see patients, some patients I would bill their insurance, you know, for a service if they had to do a limited exam. So it was just trying, I was trying to get creative. And how could we stay afloat? Now, in regards to funding, there were two, um, well, yeah, two sources of income that the government was offering, the EIDL, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, as well as the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program. So I did apply to both of those, which was a, a, a wonderful safety net during yeah. that time. But then there are so many stipulations and constant changes with those as well. Wow. You know, the EIDL, it's a loan, but a portion of it was to be given as a grant. Initially said they would give a $10,000 uh, payment. They reduced that to the number of employees you were given. But it was nice to get those funds, you know, when we weren't operating. And then with the PPP, at first, it was, you know, guidelines about when your employees need to return to work. And there was a question of what if they don't want to return to work? Because people are having life changing thought processes through this pandemic. Like, I know right? I have. Their whole yeah. life. Yeah. You know, so what if I can't get an employee to come back? Now I'm going to be penalized and now I have to pay this loan back. So it was just so much confusion. On top of that, guys. We also had new systems and protocols to put in place to treat our patients. Now, before you come in, you right. have to wear a mask. And people right. are like, why do I wear a mask to the dental office? Well, we have to protect our frontline workers. They're not in the clinical area treating patients. So we have to have an extra safeguard for them. Right. We have to take your temperature. You know, you we have to, if you are sick, you have to reschedule. If you have a temperature, you have to reschedule. You can't bring guests with you. So there are many other factors that come into play that patients have to adjust and adapt to, which can be difficult. Yeah, I uh, I, I went to uh, one of my clients, which is a dental practice, and they answered the door. I thought I was walking into a biomedical research facility <laughs> uh, at the highest level. <laughs> yeah. but, but but the grind, I mean, the grind set audience has to know that 
you have to adapt to the changes. Regulation right. comes down, the, the uh, viruses happen, and you right. have to adapt. You can complain and business fails and close, mm-hmm. or you can adapt and uh, move forward in a new world. And one benefit of dentistry, though, is we've always taken universal precautions, Mm -hmm. which means we've always protected ourselves. But now, instead of wearing the one mask, we wear two. We wear a face shield. So without extra gear, it may be freezing cold when you go into your dental office. So bring a jacket, bring a blanket. (laughs) We would would provide blankets to our patients pre-COVID, but now we can't. Right. Right. Wow. Well, well, Dr. Rosenthal, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. Um, And I love that you were very transparent and just sharing how you've been adjusting, right, in Mm -hmm. in the wake of COVID-19. But you also have a few other things going on. Tell us a little bit about the 516 Foundation and Determined to be a Doctor Someday. So the the 516 Foundation is a foundation I formed uh, in 2010. And it comes from my favorite Bible scripture, which let your light so shine that others may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. But Amen. One of the primary components is called a determined to be a doctor someday. Okay. Y'all, I grew up in North Memphis. Uh, my mom suffered from the dichotomy of mental illness and substance abuse, and I did not know my father. Okay. So growing up in North Memphis, I witnessed some of the things that most inner city kids witness, right? Right. And I always knew that if I ever made it out of North Memphis, it was my responsibility and duty to help other people to make it out too. Wow. That's why DDS was formed. I thought about all those kids who were on the Barrett places, the Decatur Avenues, the Brie Loves, the Jackson Avenues, who needed to see somebody doing more than what they were seeing in their neighborhoods. And so we take kids 14 to 18 years old, exposed to various healthcare professions, not just dentistry. Okay. Them is DDS, so they're yeah. exposed to everything. Okay. We award them scholarships, and we just have a good time. They get to network with like-minded peers mm-hmm. and people who are in a position to mentor them. That's incredible. And, and the fact that you said you take it as your responsibility to inspire people from your community, tell us about the people in your own personal life. Who inspired your entrepreneurial journey, and who even supports you now as you're going through all of these changes? So it has taken a community of people to (laughs) inspire me. And even at that time, like there was church family. I had an older sister, you know, who was kind of paving the way for me. And then I had godparents who were instrumental. My godfather was a truck driver. So I used to coin myself Hoodridge, right? Even though I was living in the hood, <laughs> I still had the Jordans, you know. Oh, I love <laughs> I it. Because he spoiled me, right? He exposed me. Really what he was doing was exposing me to entrepreneurship and he didn't even realize it. He would make me do some of his tasks and he would pay me like a little allowance to do it. And okay. some of my friends on my street didn't have that. Uh, church family, God family, real family. It was really a community. And even now, I have mentors that are my mentors and they don't even realize it. Like I watch, <laughs> I study them seriously. Yeah. Because being a mentor, I realize that it, it requires a commitment and a lot of time. And sometimes I don't want to put myself on others. So I watch from afar, but they mentor me without even knowing it. Cynthia, you're one of them. What? <laughs> yeah. As, in, as incredible as you are. No, you're you a mentor to me. You know, in this pandemic, you have taught me so much. You don't know that. I, I'm i over here speechless a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, Dr. Rosenthal, I am honored that you would say that I'm your mentor, but you have mentored me during this pandemic, and I just admire everything that you do. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but we're going to find out what's the next. You know, you have a lot on your plate now, but what's in store for Dr. Christina Rosenthal? We'll be right back after the break. Grind set. R and R on sports. Former NBA basketball player, brother Mario Ellie. Welcome to R and R on sports. Pleasure to be on here with you guys, man. Thank you guys for having me. It's R and R on sports. Grind set. Yeah, Dr. Rosenthal, thank you for sharing. But also include how you kind of manage cash flow as well, because that's the lifeblood of any business. So for me, cash is king. So as I mentioned earlier, using other people's money to you know fund things that they can fund is, is one um, suggestion that I employ. And then also realizing that you need a budget to run a business, because if you don't have a budget in place, you can be easily persuaded to just give freely and liberally, you know, and extending yourself. As a a dentist and a community advocate, I'm always 
having requests given to sponsor this or sponsor that. And so many times I have to, you know, decline requests because it's not within my budget. Right. And so as much as you want to give back to people, it's sometimes always about that bottom dollar because you're still a business at the end of the day. Right. And I don't think people realize they, they, they think that their request is the most critical, but they don't understand that they are in a line of 10 other requests. That's right. <laughs> and so you're having to prioritize, you know, who am I going to give this to? Because resources are precious. You don't want to just, you know, throw them out. And without getting a return. So even if I'm doing this, yes. you know, for a good reason, I expect some marketing from it. You know, it's 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 called a, a twofold relationship, not just <laughs> me giving you the money. That's right. That's right. And so, uh, Dr. Rosenthal, I definitely want to talk about what's next for you. But one thing we didn't touch on, you're also an author. Can you talk a little bit about the book that you've written um, and kind of what's next for you? Because you wear, again, many hats every day. So I have created a children's book called You Can Become a Doctor Too. And it stemmed from the idea of, of the Determined to Be a Doctor Someday program because I also have a toddler component. And I realized that I'm only one person. So my thought was, how could I increase capacity? How can I take my inspirational message like all over the world? Right. And it came in the form of a book. And I, it's been so well received globally, not just in the U.S. Globally. Ryan said Congratulations. global. Yeah. <laughs> and so what's next for me is more children's books. Um, I, I love dentistry and I do see multiple practices in my future. But I also have to stay true to my purpose and my calling. Right. And part right. of that too is just advocacy for youth and letting them see possibility and let them see that, you know, a brown girl just like them can come from the hood and still excel and do whatever she chooses to do and don't have to be boxed in and limited to just my trained profession. I motivational speak. I've written children's books. I've done fellowships and I say none of that to boast. I only say those things to demonstrate what is possible. So never place limitations on yourself. You are your only limitation. Absolutely. And you got me motivated now. I can hear it coming out in that last answer. So just absolutely incredible. Um, when, at what moment did you know the dentistry practice was going to work? Like, was it within that first year or did you just have a moment like, you know what? I'm so glad I did this. Um, actually, I had a moment that I had a failure. So oh. I had the, the dental practice in Memphis that was going really, really well. I had an opportunity to open a second location in Arkansas three years later after being opened in Memphis. And okay. it was a no brainer. I could service Medicaid patients right. who were just like me as a kid. Right. Uh, transportation was provided. So funding wasn't a, co a concern because they were Medicaid patients. This practice was like a grand opening, grand closing. Wow. It was wow. like a year and a half. Wow. You know, I do not use this term lightly, but I was depressed over that. I felt like a failure. People told me I was taking on too much too soon. Right. And to me, I just knew it was the right thing to do. Here you have this community that does not have a dentist, not a single dentist. Wow. And I'm thinking I mirror this community. It's primarily black. They're going to come in. And I'm going to inspire them. and They're going to see something in me. You know, all this optimism. And for right. it to fail, I felt like a failure. But when I tell you so much beauty came from that failed experience, like from that period of being uncomfortable, from that I was chosen as a participant in American Dental Association, Institute for Diversity and Leadership. From that, I got a fellowship to Harvard University. From that, I ended up becoming part of the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. And from that, I became an Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity. So, so many domino effects occurred because I failed. There's beauty and failure. Yes. And so wow. I know you asked me about, you know, the success and everything, but it's not always going to be easy in business. Right. It's going to be moments where you're going to feel and you're going to question every single thing. You're going to get up and wonder, why am I even doing this today? But I, I challenge you to let that be the moment that inspires you to do, even do more, to dig deeper and realize that it all plays a critical, critical role in your success. Well, you, you touched on a major theme of our grind set audience and, and guests, which is mental health. And so how are you taking care of your mental health? That's a great question. Definitely prayer, prayer and scripture. And I know that sounds very cliche, but it is so true. When I get my day, if I don't start my day reading the word in prayer, it just doesn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. And and I know that your audience may consist of 
many an array of beliefs and, and by no means um, do I just want to disrespect your your beliefs, but I know what carries me. I know what's right. real to me. Right. And just to give you the most authentic answer that I possibly can, it's definitely my relationship and my faith that I have in my creator. And then there's also that sense of community that brought me up from my rearing, knowing that I have people that I can cry on and I can be vulnerable with, and they don't have to see the superwoman that everybody else sees. <laughs> You know, so having those special people in my life that I can trust yes. and know that the conversation that we have is our conversation is not going to be shared with the masses. Those are two critical elements to my mental health. And then walks. I love to take walks every day and just absorb the vitamin D. <laughs> That's incredible information. And to your point, everybody has their own faith, but you have to do what works for you and motivates you. Uh, so, Dr. Rosenthal, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on Grindset today. Can you tell the listeners how they can get in contact with you, whether it's, you know, to hire you as a motivational speaker, if they want to have you to come speak to their kids, uh, get your book, become a patient. I'm a patient. I absolutely adore you and love you. So highly recommend her. Uh, but just give us all of your social media, websites, even phone number. Okay, so the practice, I need you to get a pen and paper handy, y'all, because it's a lot, okay? <laughs> the, the practice name is Paradigm Dental Center. That's P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M. The website is www.paradigmdentalcenter.com. The phone number is 901-758-2127. If you have a team, 14 to 18, we are currently accepting applications for our virtual 2000, I mean, 2020 symposium. Those applications can be found at www.determinedtobeadoctor.org, determined to be, spelled out to be, a doctor.org. And the book, if you'd like to purchase a copy of You Can Become a Doctor Too for someone in your life, it's www.youcanbecomeadoctor2.com, the title of the book. And then lastly, if you'd like me to speak to an organization that you have, you can go to www.prescribinginspiration.com. I'm also on Twitter at Memphis DDS, that's Dr. Dental Surgery, Instagram at Dr. Dr. Christina T. Rosenthal. Hey, well, Dr. Rosenthal, we're very grateful for your sharing your testimony and your story with us here on Grindset. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah. Great interview. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. We'll be right back after the break with our major keys and woman power moment. Grindset. I'm Leslie Lynn Smith, President and CEO of Epicenter, and we've partnered with Kazukian. Each episode, hosts Cynthia Daniels and Williams Brack talk shop with Memphis' brightest and best entrepreneurs. Check it out by downloading the Kazukian app or find us on your favorite podcast provider. Kazookian. Welcome back to Grind Set. We just finished interviewing Dr. Christina T. Rosenthal. Um, uh, she's the owner of Paradigm Dental Center. And her, her story growing up in North Memphis to becoming a dentist to giving back is the story of too many successful people. Um, she's probably had to work a lot harder than she needed to. But she shared some fantastic major keys along her journey. And the first one, and I think that's most important for our audience, for the grindset audience, is to bet on self. Don't be afraid to do it. I think when you're in these corporate spaces, there's something in your spirit that says you shouldn't be there or you should be doing something else. And there's another move for you. So go ahead and pursue those dreams. And then while you're at that nine to five, work strategically if you're still there. Uh, don't be afraid to plan your exit and to work towards that. And if you're a dentist or a doctor, if you have a medical practice in general, uh, run your practice like a business. And I get you have a generous spirit, but business uh, needs to be separate from your generosity. And Dr. Rosenthal created a, a, a nonprofit to do that. Pay attention to your key practice indicators. Uh, another way to say it is key performance indicators. What metrics do you need to watch to make sure your practice is healthy? And for all your dentists out there, if you're just starting, maybe fresh out of school or a few years in a practice, don't be afraid to prescribe to the uh, Dental Economics magazine. And the business lesson, well, it's a both business and personal. Cash is king and keep your credit personal and business high. Operate from the budget. And the most important one is never be afraid to fail. Cynthia. Yeah, I was absolutely inspired by this interview and I found 
uh, to me, the most fitting quote, it says, turn your wounds into wisdom. Mm. And so Dr. Rosenthal shared with us something very personal that her failure, once she was able to get through it, launched so many other incredible things after that. And that quote is from Oprah Winfrey. So I thought it was very befitting for Dr. Rosenthal and knowing that um, you'll get past those pains. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for Dr. Rosenthal sharing her wisdom um, with our audience so that we don't have to go through the same um, kind of issues and mistakes and, uh, and journey that she went through. We can learn from her and, and elevate ourselves and what we're trying to accomplish. So you've been listening to Grindset, powered by the Kazukian Network, and we'll see you next episode. Grindset, executive producer, epicenter. Grindset is directed, produced, and distributed by Kazukian. 